On Capitol Hill, there are calls to defund Planned Parenthood. And now a new video allegedly shows officials negotiating the sale of fetal body parts. The nuclear deal with Iran continues to be sold on Capitol Hill. Will it pass? And Donald Trump is surging in the polls. What's the message here? Syndicated columnist, author, and former presidential candidate Patrick J. Buchanan joins us to discuss it all. And later, he was a former Archbishop of Washington, a Vatican official, and the longest serving U.S. Cardinal in history. We'll remember Cardinal William Wakefield Baum. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. So much news to share with you. Pat Buchanan and a special remembrance of Cardinal William Baum are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show or if you have a question, I'll be live tweeting throughout the show. Find me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo or you can email me at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. More trouble for Planned Parenthood as two more undercover videos were released this week. They appear to depict Planned Parenthood officials participating in the procurement and commercial exchange of fetal body parts. In the latest video, a Planned Parenthood doctor discusses how to avoid the perception that they're selling fetal parts. Dr. Savita Gind a VP at Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains, suggests that potential contracts should be designated as research rather than a business venture. The third video released earlier in the week includes in grisly detail the dismembering of an aborted baby harvested for its desired parts. Planned Parenthood continues to say it has done nothing illegal and that the videos are misleading. A Los Angeles court has since issued a temporary restraining order preventing further releases by the Center for Medical Progress, the pro-life group that produced these undercover videos. And violence by Boko Haram in Africa continues to spread. On Monday, at least 29 people in two Christian villages were killed in northeast Nigeria. In Cameroon, suicide bombings and beheadings claimed 60 lives over the past week. Cameroonian officials Sunday ordered the closure of mosques in the north and banned child beggars after an attack of involving a 10-year-old posing as a beggar. Nigeria's new president, Mohamedou Buhari, visited Cameroon to show support for a new multinational army opposing Boko Haram. Niger and Chad are contributing to the force as well. Could some of America's first settlers have been Catholic? The question is being raised by historians and archaeologists after unearthing newly discovered artifacts in Jamestown, Virginia. Jamestown, besides being the first permanent English colony in America, is also the site of the first church in the colonies, an Anglican church. Now, all of the first settlers were believed to have been Anglican until now. The Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation unearthed the remains of several leaders of the settlement. Found among their remains was a crucifix, rosary beads, and holy medals. A small silver box was discovered with the body of Captain Gabriel Archer, one of the settlement's first leaders. Dr. William Kelso explains the box's contents. It had in it uh, a, uh, a broken holy water container known as an ampulla. Uh, and, uh, and bone, and that's often put together to make a reliquary uh, because the bones were said to be that of a saint. Captain Archer was also buried in a hexagonal wooden coffin with his head pointing east, a possible sign that he was a cleric. James Horn, president of the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation, speculates that Captain Archer could have been the leader of a secret Catholic cell and even possibly a secret Catholic priest himself. 
And in Australia, two measures legalizing same-sex marriage will be introduced in the parliament there this upcoming August. According to reports, the legislation would pass if Prime Minister Tony Abbott were to allow his Liberal Party members, that means conservative down under, a free vote. Abbott and the Liberal Party as a whole oppose same-sex marriage, and parliamentary rules require party-line votes unless stipulated otherwise by the party leader. Meanwhile, the opposition Labor Party has pledged its support for same-sex marriage and will be requiring all party members to eventually join in that effort. For the next two terms of government, members will be allowed to vote their consciences. And the Boy Scouts of America announced on Monday an end to their decades-long ban on gay scout leaders. The group's governing body concluded that the exclusion of gay adult leaders was, quote, no longer legally defensible. The decision was approved by 79 percent of the Boy Scouts executive board. While the national ban has been thrown out, the board will allow church-sponsored scout troops to exclude gay adult leaders based on their faith's religious convictions. Churches and other religious organizations sponsor approximately 70 percent of local scout troops. And the decades-long battle over a 40-foot cross on the grounds of a veterans memorial in Southern California could be coming to an end. Built in 1954, the Mount Soledad Memorial with its cross has been a fixture in San Diego County. However, in 1989, an atheist sought the removal of the cross, questioning its constitutionality since it occupied public land. The Department of Defense, veterans groups, and the courts have been wrangling with the issue ever since. Now the United States Defense Department has sold the Mount Soledad Veterans Memorial to a private organization. Part of the 2015 Defense Authorization Act, it is hoped that the transfer to private hands will end the legal battles over the cross's existence. And a few court decisions of note this week. A federal appeals court has ruled that pharmacists in Washington state must dispense Plan B and other emergency contraceptives in spite of any religious objections. In 2007, the state adopted rules mandating access to Plan B, which also acts as an abortifacient. But the state allowed individual pharmacists to refer patients to other pharmacies if they had moral objections. The three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said that was not good enough. Noting the time-sensitive nature of emergency contraception, they said in their ruling that the referral itself could lead to feelings of shame in the patient, and that could dissuade her from obtaining emergency contraception altogether. And a judge in San Diego has rejected a lawsuit challenging California's ban on doctor-assisted suicide. Superior Court Judge Gregory Pollock noted in his decision that the plaintiffs were asking the court to make a new law and that new laws should be made by the legislature or by a ballot initiative. Isn't that novel? Earlier this year, the California legislature rejected a bill legalizing doctor-assisted suicide after the Catholic Church, disability groups, and the League of United Latin American Citizens lobbied against it. The plaintiffs have promised an appeal. And Oklahoma's Supreme Court has reaffirmed its decision that the Ten Commandments monument on the state capitol grounds must be removed. The court had found previously that the six-foot monument is a religious symbol, and it must go because it violates the state's constitutional ban on using public property to benefit any one religion. Supporters of the monument say they will now seek to pass a ballot initiative amending the state constitution. And a monument originally intended to stand next to Oklahoma's Ten Commandments monument has debuted in Detroit. A satanic group unveiled a nine-foot-tall, one-ton bronze statue of the devil this past Saturday. The satanic temple, as they call themselves, is opposed to religiously themed displays on public grounds. They say their display is as much a sign of their devotion to Satan as it is a monument to free speech. The sculpture depicts Baphomet, a horned goat-headed symbol of Satan flanked by two adoring children. According to Reuters, a few hundred attended the unveiling. Detroit will not be the final resting place for the piece. 
After failing to secure a place next to the Oklahoma Ten Commandments display, the group plans to bring Satan to Arkansas, where they intend to set it next to a Ten Commandments memorial near the state capitol in Little Rock. Satan, I guess, is on the move. When we return, we'll talk U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, the Planned Parenthood videos, the Pope's climate change agenda, and much more with pundit and former presidential candidate Patrick J. Buchanan. When the World Over Live continues, stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. Donald Trump continues to ride high in the presidential polls here in the U.S. Planned Parenthood is on the hot seat over those released, recently released, explosive undercover videos. And a controversial Iran nuke deal is being sold here on Capitol Hill. With topics this diverse, there's only one guest who could possibly cover it all. He's a syndicated columnist, former advisor to three U.S. presidents, and a two-time presidential candidate himself, the most prolific, Patrick J. Buchanan. Great to see you, Good to friend. see you, Raymond. Good to have you back. Uh, I want to start with this Trump poll. Trump. In the new Quinnipiac polls, it shows Trump at 20%. Mm -hmm. You got Scott Walker at 13 and Bush down at 10%. What is happening here? Uh, Donald Trump has commanded the political stage ever since about the uh, 1st of July, if not about a week or so before. He's got a dramatic persona. He's raised this issue of immigration. Uh, people have attacked him and jumped on him. And people, American people, are looking at him and say, at least the guy's authentic, he's real, he's saying what he believes, mm -hmm. and he's up against a field which I think is fairly colorless, is sort of vanilla. And the Donald is a personality, and he's really made this, uh, he's made this race exciting and interesting. People are looking at the TV, mm. saying, what's he going to say about Rick per or Perry today? Yeah, no, <laughs> it, it, I mean, he is entertaining. He's a compelling yes. figure. He's known to many kids in, uh, who sure. watch TV, my own children. Oh, Donald Trump. I didn't know Donald Trump was running for president. So they know this guy, sure. as opposed to so many of these other candidates. It's not only that. He fills up a great empty space in American politics. The American people think the folks working up on the Hill, they get nothing done. They're all talk and no action. Mm -hmm. And when they, you know, you know, they run and they promise things and they never deliver. And he's talking about what people care about, the lost mm -hmm. jobs from these trade deals. These are the issues, yeah. Raymond, that I hit you in the 1990s. On. And also securing the border and stopping the invasion of the United States. And make, I mean, as Ronald Reagan said, a country that can't control its borders isn't really a country anymore, and that's exactly what he's saying. Now, Pat, you ran twice, and you had this same message, the Buchanan brigades out right. there. Uh, you, you, you almost took down <laughs> President Bush at the time, right. gave him a run for his money in, in New Hampshire. Right. Uh, tell me how things have changed today for an insurgent candidate mm -hmm. who is obviously running against Washington. Has the math changed given the last eight years of the Obama administration? Uh, the math in the Republican Party has not changed that greatly in my judgment, except this, there is a greater awareness in the Republican Party of the border issue than there was mm -hmm. when I raised it in 1991, 1992. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the Republican Party has lived with, and the country has lived with, all these trade deals, and they found out that all your factories and jobs, look in the first decade of this century, you got 55,000 factories were shut down and 6 million manufacturing jobs disappeared. Now, we said in 1991 and 92, this is what's going to happen. Mm. Now that it's happened, it's a little easier to make the case. Yeah. So you've got Trump in there. How has he changed the dynamics of this race, the issues that will be talked about? I mean, you mentioned two of the biggies, trade mm -hmm. and immigration. Uh, these are things that, let's face it, some of the other candidates, a lot of these other candidates are not talking about, really don't want to talk about. Has he made these two issues must discuss for whoever 
ends up with this nomination? I think he's not only done that, certainly on the immigration issue, the border fence and security on the border, and secondly on the trade issue, but the Republican Party is locked into its free trade agenda ideologically and because the folks down the street at the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, the mm -hmm. Fortune 500, they say, look, we want the ability to move our factories to Asia and bring our products back free of charge, and that's what we give you all this money for. Mm -hmm. And Trump is hammering that issue, but he's doing something else also, as I said. He's filling up this vacuum, and the fact that people are piling on him, there's a real belief in, in the country, I think, that the political class, the ruling class, has failed America, and that's exactly what he is saying, and they are all part of it. Mm. Is there another candidate that you see in this lineup who could possibly step into the position should Trump begun, begin to fail? I mean, this guy's got a 58 percent negative rating right now in the polls, Pat. 58 percent, right? 58 percent negative. Those are really high negatives. You get 42 percent in the primaries, you win. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you just don't, don't worry is. about the negatives. Is that the Buchanan math here? Well, like, you know, I found, I mean, when I was running, I found out what was it against Bush. It was Brown, Clinton, Buchanan, and Bush were the last four standing right. in the two parties. All four of us had negatives in the 40s. Hmm. All four of us. I was, of course, my positives weren't that high, but all four of us <laughs> had the same negatives. And, and, negatives, at least. and th that's what these—that's what these things do to you. But you mentioned one individual. I had thought there was one, and that's Ted Cruz, hmm. uh, because he is a—he's a terrific speaker. He's a debater. And he's been standing by Trump's statements on the border and defending him against these attacks. That's mm -hmm. another thing that's helped Trump, is the piling on by his fellow Republicans, get out of the race, mm -hmm. and the media, get out of the race. Who are these people to tell individuals whether or not they're allowed to run for president of the United States? And so I think when they all piled on, the American people tend to say, look, I'll go with the underdog here. Uh, and you, you believe Trump can go all the way here? Well, see, I believe if, if now we don't know, as I said, if, uh, if there's a possibility he could implode or explode somewhere along the way or make some statement or some of the oppo researchers dig up things that are really very bad well, news, I, worse than everything. As, as you but wrote, it, this is a, the presidential race is a minefield for the cautious, and Trump is not a cautious man, for the incautious. Incautious, and he's not a cautious man, that's mm -hmm. right. But he's made a couple of gaffes. But the American people, I mean, I think to their credit, are saying, look, okay, he shouldn't have said that, that you know, that uh, McCain failed because he was captured yeah. or something like that. It was ridiculous. But they say that doesn't justify a death sentence in politics or driving him out of the race when we haven't had a chance to vote. Mm. No, it's interesting. Christie and Cruz are the two guys who have sort of supported Trump and his right. run every step of the way. I don't he's know whether got, they he, step in or not. He, he has assets that uh, they don't have, and of course he's he's consuming all the oxygen out there. He really is. These other fellows can't get any airtime. When they get airtime, they're asked, "What do you think, think about Trump? Donald Trump?" <laughs> yeah, that's not what you want to hear. Uh, amazingly, th there's a St. Petersburg poll came out today. It shows Trump at 26 percent, beating Bush, who's at 20, and Marco Rubio at 10 percent. That's in the state of Florida, well, which you, is stunning. Well, if you had the primary in Florida and that's the outcome, that would be the end of the race. So you really think he, he well, has see, he I, I, you know, it's a tremendous. I mean, we've seen him in the last time out. You saw Herman Cain was in yep. the lead, and Michelle Bachman was in the lead, and Newt had a real run, mm -hmm. and all of them had a run. Uh, and and it can it can be that he's that he implodes or he goes down and he and you all of a sudden run the Iowa caucuses and say he runs third or fourth. Mm -hmm. That would knock it knock the air out. He'd have to come back in, in New Hampshire. But if it were right now. And these kinds of numbers and this surge kind of going on, mm -hmm. I bet he wishes it were January 1. I need to go to this Planned Parenthood video, the latest undercover video of Planned Parenthood officials discussing mm -hmm. the sale and acquisition of body parts was released this week. Now, this is Dr. Savita Gind. She's the VP and medical director of the Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. Watch this. It's disturbing. We do tissue collection for
There you go. Yep. We got all of them right and there. another boy! Disturbing, disturbing video. And at the end, you heard the, the, the guy, they're right. poking at the dish there, and they had the, the body parts of this child. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, it's a boy. Mm -hmm. It is staggering that you have pe these people admitting. Last week, they were saying this is fetal tissue. Now we're talking about body parts and identifying the remains as a boy. Mm -hmm. What does this represent for Planned Parenthood? Well, what it represents for the country, unbelievably cold and callous. Uh, ideological indifference to human life. I mean, the, these tapes sound like something out of the Tiergarten 4 program mm. in Berlin, yeah. you know, when they took the useless eaters, the people uh, mm. who really weren't needed and we had to get rid of and, and, and just put them away and, and felt they were doing something. This is Darwinism at its, you know, right at, the, at its end worst. Let me tell you, there's a real, most of us grays, I don't care, we're not, you know, wonderful people, but there's a real moral sensibility that's just revolted by what, what, what when in seeing all this, eating a salad and drinking wine and talking about, you know, selling the body parts of an infant that's been destroyed in the womb with the collaboration of its mother and, uh, and some, quote, doctor. Yeah. No, it's standard. This is, you know, I think a lot of Americans of my generation <laughs> Never thought they'd Five live stars. in a country like that. Like I, I have to tell you, I, the, the repulsion mm -hmm. that I've seen in the emails and the calls, some of these people are identifying as pro-choice. These are people who support abortion right. rights. They are stunned like by this, like this because I, I think for the first time people are having to confront the reality mm -hmm. that this is a human life being taken. Mm -hmm. Wherever anybody is on the spectrum of support for the sure. public policy, the reality of this and the grisly business of mm -hmm. dedicating remains for research or other uses mm -hmm. is just, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's abominable is what it is. This is Cecile Richards, not the, the lion we keep hearing so much about who was shot in, in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, this is Cecile Richards. She's the president of Planned Parenthood responding to the video you just saw and others like it. This has been a three-year, uh, well-funded effort by the most of the anti-abortion movement in this country to try to entrap doctors and, of course, highly doctored videos, which show absolutely, they doctors repeatedly said, it's all been edited out, Planned Parenthood does not at all profit from fetal tissue donation, which is an important, important element of healthcare research in this country. She's denying any culpability here. She says this is oh. perfectly legal, Pat. Well, she says there's parts of the tape where doctors are saying we're not selling body parts mm -hmm. or something like that. But that doesn't deny the reality of what these folks said, what they're talking about, what we saw, and what they did. And the idea that you can take an unborn child fighting for life and look at it as something, you know, like we can take its parts after we kill it, crush the head, crush the body parts, and save the special parts for sale, in America in 2015 is astonishing. No, well, I, I mean, people can say what they want about doctored video, and look, we're both in sure, television, right? we've been in broadcast, there is video that's doctored. The, watching that undoctored video, just that segment, where they're poking with a stick through the remains and say, hey, you like an eyeball, you want a heart, and oh, look, here's a leg, and it's a boy. Mm -hmm. That alone is the most indicting bit of video. Right. I don't know how, I don't know what you say to that, that grisly manifestation. Well, you know, and, uh, you know, what, what does it say about the people that can do that so casually yeah. when you realize that this unborn child has been murdered, torn to pieces, and you're looking at the results of what was done? Mm -hmm. Pat, uh, there is an effort on Capitol Hill to defund Planned Parenthood. Mitch McConnell has scheduled what we have to admit right. is little more than a pro forma vote. Right. Uh, it doesn't look like he's going to get the 60 votes. That's what you'd need to override the presidential veto. Uh, is, is this just kabuki on Capitol you need, Hill? You need 67 to override the presidential veto, but I think they ought to do it. I think they ought to, you know, put that up and say, look, this is what we're voting against. Mm -hmm. If you fellas want to vote for it, go ahead and vote for it. But we are revolted by this whole thing, repulsed by it, and we'd like to go on record and say we want no part of an organization that does that, and we don't want to give the tax dollars of the American people to people like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, well, the vote is going forward on Monday, but passage does not. The Senate, the Senate, I mean, with the, it'll be interesting to see who votes 
that way on it. But, you know, yeah. they're going to defund the whole organization. That's half a billion dollars. Right. right. Well, the yeah. problem is this bill wouldn't even touch all the Medicare reimbursement, Medicaid reimbursements. Right. That's where it all flows through. It, 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 Planned Parenthood has so many funding mm -hmm. mechanisms mm -hmm. through the via the federal government. It's very difficult to get a handle on all of them. Mm -hmm. But we will continue to watch this and we'll be right back when we'll explore the Iranian nuclear deal and the Pope's climate change mission, mm -hmm. as well as what he could say when he visits the U.S. in September. Patrick Buchanan remains with us when the world of our live continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. Syndicated columnist, author, and two-time presidential candidate, Pat Buchanan, is once again at the desk with us. Let's get into this Iranian nuclear deal. Minority leader Nancy Pelosi today called the deal a diplomatic masterpiece. What's wrong with that, Pat? <laughs> well, let me say this. The deal is going to go through. Mm. It's, going to be, uh, it's going to go through because if the United States, for example, if they overrode the president's veto of their rejection of the deal, mm -hmm. the United States would be relatively isolated and all these other countries would simply head straight for Iran. And if Iran is smart, which I think they're very smart, uh, they would simply agree to the terms of the deal and follow them scrupulously, and the Americans would be outside the, outside the whole uh, the whole the whole business mm -hmm. and I think you'd have a lot of American businesses climbing the walls but let me say this I have been of the view for a long time that Iran doesn't want to bomb they have the ability and the knowledge to build one they could have built one long ago mm -hmm. they stopped short of that they didn't uh, you know, they didn't take the uranium up to 90 percent enrichment they did mm -hmm. that for a reason they're using the negotiations to get the sanctions lift go back into the international community to get all that money and to be recognized because if they can get peace, if they can avoid war with the United States, mm. the Iranians in 10 years, along with uh, Shia Iraq, will be the dominant power in the Persian Gulf. That's what they're interested in being. Mm. And vis -a -vis Israel. You know, I don't think the Iranians want to bomb. The Israelis got dozens, scores, hundreds of bombs. But what they don't have is the size of the country and the population. It's 10 times as large. Mm -hmm. Over time, Iran is going to, if it avoids a war with the United States, is going to be the dominant power in the Gulf. And that's why they negotiated the deal and gave away so much stuff that they did. Mm, yeah, well, they didn't give away much, Pat. They, 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 well, you've got, got to give them 24 hours notice before you do inspections. Look, I mean, <laughs> th this is not a good deal, Pat. But no, well, let me say this. Look, they got a rack. They got rid of their, their plutonium reactor. That's out the window. Four down. Now all the all the centrifuges are gone. The high quality centrifuges, 98 percent of the uraniums. They're throwing all that stuff out because they said, "Look, we know how to build a bomb. We don't need all this. Mm -hmm. You give us the 100. I'd take if I were Iranian, I'd take the 150 billion." I said, "We know how to do that. Mm -hmm. If we want to build a bomb down the road, we're going to risk war with the United States if you try it, and we don't want war with the Americans. If we stay out of a war with the Americans." The future belongs to us. I want to play Secretary <laughs> John Kerry, who probably would like the Buchanan approach well, on this. Here he is <laughs> pitching the deal. <laughs> right. <laughs> incentive for an arms race in the region for Egypt or Saudi Arabia or one of the other countries to try to get a bomb will be if this agreement is rejected. And the reason will be that Iran will go back to enriching. We will not have inspection. We will not have insight. And they will say, oh, my God. What do you think? I don't think Iran would go back to enriching. I think Iran would it's not follow their the deal. Well, follow the deal. Then you get the Europe, the UN's lifted sanctions, the Europeans lift sanctions, the Russians, Chinese, and the Americans are sitting there and don't, and the Iranians are saying, look, we signed an agreement, we honor our agreements, so those Americans look at them, mm -hmm. here comes all the money, and the American business guys are going to be saying, why are all the Europeans in Tehran mm -hmm. selling cars and TVs, and we're not? And we're not, we don't have access the point, to the market. The, the, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is where Netanyahu Yahoo and all the others, they say, they're racing to a bomb, they're two weeks from a bomb, they're going to get it. No, they're not. They didn't move past a certain threshold because they want the deal to get rid of the sanctions. They've got the ability to build a bomb, but they say, look, we build a bomb over here, we'll have one. The Israelis got 200, and, and they put a hair trigger on their nuclear arsenal. 
what happens to us if we one of the a bomb goes off somewhere? Mm -hmm. They will blame us. And what happened to our neighbor Saddam when that happened? Mm. There, there, there have been some there have been some some concerns raised about the way this. I get some, I'm hearing some dissent here. No, no, no dissent. I, I'm, I'm throw, I am playing the 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 devil's the advocate. Devil's advocate Diabolus advocatus. Uh, no, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> the main negotiator on the Iranian side, Zarif. Is who was who was negotiating with Kerry? There are some who are saying that relationship was a little too cozy. Kerry and Zarif knew each other. They met at right. a George Soros dinner, and apparently, Zarif's son stood in John Kerry's daughter's wedding. Is that a concern to you that they may have been too cozy and that Iran shaped this deal and America gave away too much? Well, you know, I think maybe we could have got a better deal. But I'll be honest, when I saw it come out. And they saw Fordow, they're going to be all the uranium's coming out, all the centrifuges are shut down, 98% of the Iraq concern, it's plutonium producing, mm -hmm. you need a refining plant at the end. They get no refining plant and they're going to turn the heavy water into a light water. You say, why are they doing all this if they're out to build a bomb? Mm. Answer is, they're using <laughs> this for another purpose. Yeah. And the Americans, of course, all oh, they're going to have a bomb. But, you know, 24 days, do you really think you can put together centrifuges and get them working? Working and get the highly enriched 90 percent uranium mm. in 24 days. See, I, I interviewed Chris Christie a few weeks ago, and he said Ronald Reagan would have walked away from a deal like this. You were there at Reykjavik when he did walk away there. from I the deal. I, I was right, looking right down at him when he walked out of that room. Should they have walked out of this deal? Reagan was right to walk out of that when they were taking away SDI. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Reagan had cut a deal, frankly, which I didn't like, it was you know getting rid mm -hmm. of nuclear weapons. And fortunately, Gorbachev said. We're going to you will go with all the getting rid of all these offensive weapons. But by the way, you got to give up your SDI, mm. which was a stupid thing to say. He brought it in late Sunday night mm. and Reagan just, you know, pounded the table. He came out. His face was a mask of rage. I don't want to repeat some of the things he said at the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> but we came. Those home. memoirs let are me going to be you, good. But let me tell you, I came back with him on Air Force One and I was drinking and laughing along with Tony Dolan. Mm -hmm. And here comes Reagan back in the plane. He's got his little running suit on and said, Pat, did I tell you about the time Jimmy Stewart and I were? Because, <laughs> he was right back to. He was right back. <laughs> back to the I old said to myself, Reagan. Guys, this was part of this man is 14 years old. <laughs> and that, he was that, wonderful. And that was so, the charm, you know. He was so attractive about him, but he was, you know, but he it was just a phenomenal day, a wow. phenomenal night. Yeah, well, he and he ended up winning. I mean, he he, he won well, big I told and him, played hard. I told him on the plane. I said, don't worry. The Russians will come back for the INF agreement. It's the intermediate nuclear forces mm -hmm. in Europe. They were scared to death of our Pershings and crews. I said, that's why they've come to Reykjavik. They're going to come back to get that deal. And they came back that November, and Reagan, gave, we gave up the Pershings and crews, mm -hmm. and they gave up their SS-20s. I need to refer to a column you recently wrote, and I'll use it as a means of getting right. into oh, our <laughs> conversation of Pope Francis and what he might or might well, say with the United States. One of the things I said to Tim Russell, we're going to do all the golden oldies, are we? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is a golden reason. <laughs> this is from July 14th. You okay. wrote, the headline was, Is Capitalism Diabolic? Uh -huh. And you're referring to Pope Francis's right. statements in South America, particularly in Bolivia, where he called capitalism an intolerable system. What are your concerns about that? Uh, I think the, the Holy Father, when it comes to economics, I think he is too much a man of the neo-socialist left. I think he looks upon capitalism almost in a Marxist view. To me, the, the free enterprise system, as it's evolved and developed, is the, the greatest uh, promoter of prosperity, and it's moved more people out of mm -hmm. poverty into the working class and the middle class than any other system on earth. Now, does it have real problems? Are there? I mean, are we now with a financial community up in New York? They're the ones getting all the money, and the working class jobs are going to. Yeah, can it be approved? But look, we ask for which is a better system. Mm. I mean, it's certainly not the Marx. It's certainly not what they had down there in Argentina. Yeah. I mean, they went uh, they went belly up about 15 years ago. Now, some will say, "Look, he is he's trying to attach a moral vision to this to the capitalist system. He's concerned that the focus has been solely on profit to the exclusion of your fellow man and the humanity at play." Well, he's, look, he, he, there's a very valid point there, but the purpose of business. 
these all, people go into business and they buy and provide things and grow things in order that they can make a profit so they can feed their family out of that. Mm -hmm. And that profit motive is a part of human nature. Now, mm -hmm. does it get out of control if you get one individual, you know, playing mon you play yep, Monopoly, play Monopoly. Kid, that's right. you get all the houses <laughs> and all the build, build on all the properties and then you run everybody out of business and kill them. Uh, I can tell you, you were the top hat, weren't you? You were the hat all the top time. Top hat coming around. Yeah. Right. Like and you a, kept passing. And go. Walk in Park Place. <laughs> to own them all and kill everybody else. <laughs> exactly. But so I but mean, he's I, right there. But yeah. but you know. But but you're concerned about the way he goes about rectifying that using having uh, well, there's, I mean, invoking again, an international system that should somehow sure, redistribute I mean, wealth. Yeah, and a globaliza the globalization and you know, some kind of global people running the. That's look, you got that in the European Union. Mm -hmm. Ask the Greeks if it's working out well for them. Mm. Let's talk about his climate change uh, agenda, which right? he has been pushing mightily. Well, again, he, again. He, he invited all the mayors, many mayors from the U.S. and around the world right. into the Vatican just a few weeks ago. Right. And they have signed on to this effort to push these climate have? reforms that the U.N. is considering in December in Paris. A good idea or has he exceeded his, his charism? Well, there's no, I think he's well outside the, the realm of where he is speaking on faith and morals and he's speaking on issues quite frankly, where I think there's legitimate dissent. I mean, I am a climate change skeptic. Mm. I hope that doesn't excommunicate me, automatic excommunication. But I also think he is speaking out. And look, we do have, we are stewards of the earth. And the, when I was growing up, the, the air was dirty, the Potomac was polluted, it mm -hmm. may still be in the oceans and everything. And we've done a tremendous amount to clean that up. But again, America's done more almost than any country in the world. That Maybe we've got to do more. But the idea of a globalized uh, entity mm. imposing its views and values, that is, opens the door to global tyranny. Mm. We've also got our traditions. I don't think the Holy Father really understands, you know, the problems and benefits of the American free enterprise system, and it does have a lot of problems. Uh, as well as he might if he hadn't been raised, quite frankly, down there with the, with the guys who with the shiny boots and sunglasses. <laughs> the Peron? The Peronistas. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's talk for a moment. About what do you think he's going to say when he comes here, particularly this joint session of Congress? I think he'll probably, uh, he'll probably say many of the same things. It's such a golden opportunity. I think the president, I mean, excuse me, the Holy Father is, uh, as I am, something of a confrontationist. Mm. And I think, he will, I think he will read us the riot act uh, in, a, in a kind way. But I think he's going to say a lot of things, such as he's been saying on climate change and on poverty and on Mal Betty gets into the immigration issue. Mm -hmm. And he will not. Uh, he will not emulate Donald Trump. Mm. <laughs> Let's go to this last issue we have to touch before I let you go. This is Robert Gates, the national president of the Boy Scouts of America, on their decision to allow gay scout leaders mm -hmm. into the organization. We'll play this, and I want the Buchanan right. take on it. Roll it. Due to the social, political, and legal changes taking place in our country and in our movement. I did not believe the adult leadership policy could be sustained. Any effort to do so was inevitably going to result in simultaneous legal battles in multiple jurisdictions and at staggering cost. What do you make of that justification for the decision? It explains it, quite frankly. They're going to, take, they're going to file lawsuits against the Boy Scouts in state after state after state, mm -hmm. discrimination and all the rest of it. Fighting all these law school, lawsuits will bankrupt the organization. So he said, you know, what's coming? And maybe we're going to have to make this retreat on this issue. But uh, I think it could be the sort of beginning of the end of the Boy Scouts. I mean, mm. I think this is, well, I think it's awful because, look, whether we like it or not, the, the statistics will tell you the probability is far higher of abuse of, uh, of boys by active homosexuals who have them in their custody. And we don't need to go too far outside the Catholic Church to understand that. Mm. So uh, I think the Mormons, I guess, are looking at whether they want the Boy Scouts to continue. I think the Catholic Church should take a take a long, hard look at whether they want to continue the association. Well, the, well they, Robert Gates made the point and the, the mm. council, the board that works with the Bishop's Conference over that, that oversees right. the Catholic involvement in the Scouts, they think, okay, our religious rights will be protected. We'll see. but. 
if the justification for changing the policy was you were worried about litigation, how do you stop the same litigation challenging the religious exemption well, the, or carve-out, right? You get, you get the First Amendment with the religious exemption with the uh, with the church, just like you do on mm -hmm. on contraception and abortifacients and things mm -hmm. like that. And you might, there. you might. Well, I think the church would probably, I mean, I would go along with the church if it said, look, we're not going along with this policy and we think we're protected by it because we're the Catholic church and we got a First Amendment right to exclude or include whoever we want on a moral grounds. Mm. And then if you win the battle, you've got the victory. And if you don't, uh, goodbye and good luck. Mm. Very good. Well, we'll leave it there. And Pat Buchanan, right. goodbye and good luck. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Pat. Pat's latest book, The Greatest Comeback, How Richard Nixon Rose to Defeat to Create the New Majority, is still available in bookstores everywhere and online. It's before all the bad things happen, Raymond. There, there, there you go. Well, you, and you were there right before it all happened, Pat. Up next, we'll remember the former Archbishop of Washington, Cardinal William Wakefield Baum, when the world over continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. He was the longest serving U.S. Cardinal in church history. Cardinal William Wakefield Baum died here in Washington this week at the age of 88. Cardinal Baum served in many important posts during his long career as Archbishop of Washington from 1973 to 1980, and then as head of the Apostolic Penitentiary at the Vatican until his retirement in 2001. He also served on the commission that developed the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I sat down with Cardinal Baum at his apartment in Rome several years ago to discuss his relationship with St. John Paul II, his work on the Catechism, and the great gift of his priesthood. Here are some highlights of my interview with William Cardinal Baum. Your Eminence, today marks the 23rd anniversary oh, yes. of your arrival here in Rome. Yes. What have these past 23 years meant to you, being so close and collaborating with the Holy Father yes. in this way? Well, it's been a, a spiritual experience, first mm -hmm. of all, and then to be close to the Holy Father has meant so much to me. To see a man of such holiness. He's so obviously, obviously a man of great talent, yeah. intellectual, and uh, a man of great courage. But he also is a man who radiates um, holiness. Mm -hmm. That is, this, his personal union with our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is, that is what has inspired me most of all. Your Eminence, what do you think will be, in the final analysis, this Pope's greatest legacy? It's very hard to answer that I question. I know, it's a tough There's one. There's so many things that he does, but I'll just mention a, a few. Uh, one of the greatest gifts he has given us is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Mm. Following the Second Vatican Council, we went through a period of, of trial, I would say, uh, assimilation. The Holy Father himself was a bishop during the Council, and very active. He was a real protagonist mm. during the Second Vatican Council as a young bishop. And he has a deep understanding of the Council, what it was and what it is meant to be in the life of the Church. What we need, though, are ways in which that can be integrated, the teaching of the Council, with all of Catholic truth, the heritage of the Catholic Church. And the Holy Father sees that very clearly. And the catechism of the Catholic Church is a way of approaching that. Your Eminence, I want to talk about some issues facing yes. the Church now. One of the great questions coming out of the Council was, what of the liturgy? Yes. What would become of the liturgy? And what shape was it intended to be from the onset? Yes. Uh, we have seen clarifications of that. Your thoughts on that and the general direction of things now? The liturgy <clears throat> is clearly what it has always been. It is this worship, the worship of God in and through Christ Jesus. And it is Christ Jesus in us who makes worship possible. Because we are one in his body, we are lifted up, made holy, and we become the holy people of God, the priestly people who offer praise and sacrifice to God. 
at all times. And the document is very clear on that. It wasn't new to emphasize that active participation in the liturgy mm -hmm. is essential for the life of a Christian. That was already known and had been repeated often by modern popes, especially Pope St. Pius X, sure. Pius XI, Pius XII, um, perhaps some of older readers and some of the older members of your audience will remember the encyclical of Pius XII, Mediator Dei, the mediator of God, uh, which was a beautiful letter on the nature of the liturgy. And the first paragraph of the council document on the liturgy cites that. Ah. That's important, that what the liturgy document wants to say is clearly in continuity with Catholic tradition mm -hmm. and with what other pontiffs and uh, the, the other councils have had to say about the liturgy. The nature of the, the Mass and the way it played out, and as you said, the interpretation. Yes. Yes. At times, I, I interviewed yes. uh, Cardinal Dulles. He said that, that things, that they breathed what they wanted into some of the letter of Vatican II. I believe that's true. I believe some who didn't perhaps read the letter, mm -hmm. didn't or read the document, the constitution on the liturgy, I think they did interpret it in their own way, even without reading it. And they understood it uh, in ways that were beyond the purpose of the council. Uh, for example, if I can do it in this way, sure. great emphasis on the act of worship as the worship of the assembly of the people. Well, it is that, surely. That's undeniable. And we are gathered together, and we should be conscious of that right. in, in our worship. Right. Very conscious of it. We're not there simply as individuals, although we are there as individuals, yeah. but we do it in company with our fellow believers. But you have to understand the idea of the assembly, you have to see it also in the light of the mystery of the mystical body of Christ. Mm -hmm. That this assembly is different from other assemblies where people get together with common belief and common cause under the presidency of someone. Uh, I think an illustration of, of what went wrong here and there was to see the priest simply as the one who presides over the assembly. Mm -hmm. He does preside over the assembly, certainly. But he is also there in the person of Jesus Christ. In persona Christi. In persona Christi. And I think that has needed emphasis. And we're coming to that. And in recent days we've seen, or years rather, we've seen Cardinal Ratzinger uh, speaking of the silence needed in the liturgy. That's right. The return I, to some of the Latin and the reverence. I, re I agree with Cardinal Ratzinger on that. I think we need more moments of silence in the sacred liturgy. For example, uh, after we've received Holy Communion. We need some time to pause, reflect on what we have received, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we tremble before this mystery. Sure, uh, sure. We, we're, we kneel, we're prostrate before this mystery, and we should feel this with great humility, what a great gift is given us, and we need time to ponder that. And sometimes in our liturgies, we don't have much time no. for, for uh, thoughtful prayer. Every moment is filled with sound. Right. And I think that is perhaps one of the mistakes we've made. You were prefect of Catholic education. Yes. Uh, I would like your view on Ex Cordia Ecclesia, yes. from the heart of the church, yes, the papal the document, the church. Right. trying to uh, revivify, if you will, the Catholic identity of higher education. Yes. Where is that Catholic identity today, in your opinion, in the United States? Yes. Um, first of all, it was close to the heart of the Holy Father. Ex Cordia Ecclesia, Ex Cordia Ioannis Pauli, Secundi, I would say, he was very concerned with this. Uh, he himself was a man who had an academic background as a professor, as mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. many of our listeners sure. are aware of that. He was very anxious to say something about Catholic universities throughout the world to affirm their Catholic character. What has happened in the United States, I fear, here and there, is a kind of secularizing of our Catholic universities, mm -hmm. a, a loss of their Catholic character or as it's sometimes called, identity. Mm -hmm. In various ways, this has happened, and has happened little by little. 
and it is sobering. Well, Ex Corte Ecclesiae was meant to recall Catholic universities to the, their relationship with the church, that uh, they are not simply um, universities with a Catholic atmosphere, um, certain Catholic ceremonies perhaps, mm -hmm. a chaplain here and there, but that they really are from the very heart of the church, the church's way of serving. In, the church was the great mother of universities right. throughout the world, and it, they were inspired by faith. And that's what the Holy Father would like to see in our Catholic universities of today. It does not mean a retreat from the world in any way. Uh, uh, it does not recommend uh, uh, being totally apart. It, in fact, it's all in favor of the church's involvement mm -hmm. in the world, in its needs, its sufferings, its uh, progress in every way, but it must do it in a Catholic way. John Paul II has spoken at length about a springtime, a yes. coming springtime yes. in the church. Yes. Do you see that springtime coming, and in what shape? Well, how do you see it, if you see it at all? I, I'm not clairvoyant. <laughs> I'm not able to see very far into the future. But I'll mention a few things that are signs of hope, mm -hmm. I believe, for the future. One is a renewed devotion to the most blessed sacrament. I think that is very significant, that everywhere, even countries and places where it had been somewhat neglected, mm -hmm. underestimated, I see a return to that. The, the idea of adoration of the blessed sacrament throughout the day and the night, a way of professing our faith in the true presence of Jesus Christ in the most holy sacrament. That is very important. And uh, the, the Eucharist is at the heart of our life. We draw all of our strength from Jesus Christ, and He is most of all in the sacrifice of the Mass and in the sacrament of His body and blood. Hmm. And though I see this return to Eucharistic piety, if I can call it that, right. one of the signs of hope. The other we've already touched upon, a return to the reception of the sacrament of penance. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend also to your viewers frequent reception of the sacrament of penance. Mm -hmm. Other signs, I'm not sure. This though, it's clear that throughout the world there's a hunger, a hunger, thirst for God, for life. And Catholics can play this. They can be the people of hope. Yeah. As John Paul is the prophet of hope, yeah. Catholic people, the laity, have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. We priests can only speak to relatively few people, right. but the laity can speak to all, mm -hmm. and they should be witnesses, fellow citizens participating in the life of their nations, their peoples, but also people who mirror their belief in Christ Jesus. Tell me, as you look across the world now, what do you see as the greatest threat to the church today? Well, we've already touched on it, I think. It's this kind of um, laziness, personal, spiritual laziness, failure to pray personally. Personal prayer mm -hmm. is one, and I would not to want to go away without mentioning it. I've mentioned it with regard to adoration of the Blessed mm -hmm. Sacrament, but personal prayer in our lives, that's very important. None of, none of the people who watch EWTN should ever, ever fail to pray throughout the day as they arise in the morning, throughout, and it, when they go to bed, and as often as, as ask God's help to be mindful of Him throughout the day, so that they are always receiving His, His gift of love and also giving it to others. That's one of the uh, uh, great, um, great um, uh, very important in my opinion. Uh, but more serious, and this is something that troubles me more than anything else, a questioning of the fundamental truth about Jesus Christ. Perhaps some of the people of, who watch EWTN remember that um, about three years ago, I believe, there was a document from the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith, yes. but very explicitly and in a special way approved by the Holy Father. That is, he made it his own, mm -hmm. called <clears throat> the Lord Jesus. Dominus Jesu. It's a very simple document in some ways. It's limpid and expresses itself briefly, the truth about Jesus Christ, true God and true man, right. something we've already <clears throat> spoken of. I think 
doubts about that, about the divinity of our Lord, mm -hmm. that about the truth of the Incarnation, or related to it, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ as the only Savior and the only mediator. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the most serious problems we face. It isn't made explicit very much in our country, but there are tendencies there, and not only in the United States, I'm not speaking of America, but elsewhere, <clears throat> in Europe, in Asia. Uh, it sometimes comes from a desire to <clears throat> promote good relations with non-Christian religions. And that we all understand that. We want to do that, <clears throat> but not at the risk of denying what is fundamental truth. Final question, Your Eminence. Looking back on your <clears throat> long career in Washington, here in Rome, mm -hmm. yes. What do, you, what do you consider your most important contribution? It's the same contribution that I've made since I was ordained a priest. The most important, important contribution is that I celebrate Mass every day. <clears throat> Simple as that. Yes. That outweighs the other things. Because there, I know despite my own <clears throat> infirmity, I know that Jesus Christ is acting in me. So I would say standing at the altar uh, in the person of Christ, the head of the mystical body, that that's the great gift that, that, that the Lord makes in me, for me as an instrument. And closely related to that is absolving sinners, mm -hmm. extending to them the love, the mercy of our Lord, who loves sinners, <clears throat> call them to repentance. Those are the two things that, that, that uh, I believe are most important in my life. May William Cardinal Baum rest in peace. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Sign up for my free e-blast. You'll get information you won't find anywhere else. And don't miss next week. As the UN prepares to approve its goals for sustainable development, Congressman Chris Smith joins us to discuss the disturbing details of those goals and the unexpected parties supporting it. Plus, syndicated radio talk show host Laura Ingram will be here to discuss the presidential sweepstakes and much more. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Thank <laughs> you.